the promise that we find with King David and his descendant who will sit on the throne forever is that there is a good king who can solve all of our problems. There is, uh, because when, when the people came to Samuel last Sunday, we talked about how they came to Samuel and said, we want a king. They wanted a centralized power and they thought that a centralized power of their nation would be able to unite them better and they would be able to do things better. And they were wrong and they were right. They were wrong because one selfish human being at the top of the whole hierarchy is just going to cause more problems. And God warned him, he's going to tax you. He's going to take your best sons, use them in his military. He's going to take your best daughters and they will be the servants in his palace. And you will tax all of your best bulls, all of your best cows, all of your best goats, all of your best sheep. And he'll feast on all of that stuff. Are you sure you want a king? Don't you want to just keep having God as your king? But they wanted a king, and so they got the king they deserved, King Saul. A good man until he wasn't anymore. And he disobeyed the Lord. That was the theme of last Sunday's message. And the Lord, where our story picks up today, spoke to Samuel and said, How long will you mourn over King Saul? I've chosen someone else. And so... Samuel is sent by God. And I, I love this. Some of you uh, may not know, but um, I'm... How do I describe this? What does the word Baptocostal mean here? I don't know. Uh, I believe... We believe, and the Bible teaches very much in the working of the Holy Spirit. Okay? It doesn't mean that we got to fall down in the middle of the worship service. In fact, I can't find that anywhere in Scripture. I think it's kind of funny when people are like, we're a biblical church, we don't speak in tongues. I, w I always want to say, <laughs> now hold on, that one's in the Bible. <laughs> Let's not pick on that one too much. You know, okay, that one's actually in there. But, but uh, the Holy Spirit does so much. People can't lead in church without the power of the Holy Spirit. People, people, you can't witness and tell people about what Jesus means to you and why they should trust in Jesus without the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, if it wasn't for the power of the Holy Spirit and the belief that I'm actually going to get up here on a Sunday morning and actually do some good, I wouldn't get up here. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. And so I love preaching because I love the feeling of the Holy Spirit just going right through me, just, just to have a front row seat for everything that God wants to say to His people. And I know I'm only human. Not everything that I say is right, but everything the Holy Spirit says through me is right. And it's a fun thing to get to do and my privilege to do this for you people. And of course, the Bible is here to keep me on track. The book that the Holy Spirit Himself wrote through various human authors throughout centuries and centuries. And Samuel, he's got to be one of my favorite prophets. He's a little kid and he gets his first prophecy. The Spirit speaks through him as a kid. And as he gets older, you know, God... And, and in this instance, God says, Samuel, go to the territory of the tribe of Judah. Go to the region of Ephrathah and go to the village of Bethlehem. And I'm going to show you who's going to be the new king. And already you understand that the, the, the dynasty of Saul is over because that's not even the right tribe for Saul. Saul is of the tribe of Benjamin. And so he goes to Judah. And if you remember your stories, uh, if you remember, if you've been... Take, keeping track and taking notes. Judah is the eldest of the brothers. After Reuben, who did something stupid and lost his birthright. After Simeon and Levi, the next two, who committed a bunch of murder and lost their birthright. And so Judah was number four in the birth order. And he did something stupid and repented of it and, ma and made it right. And God preserved that his tribe would rule over the land of Israel, the people of Israel. And he goes to this, Samuel, of course, goes to Bethlehem and they see him coming, right? This is the man with the power of God. And God likes to level cities when he gets mad at them, right? And so here comes Samuel and the elders of the village meet him outside of the village. Whoa, here comes Samuel. Let's go see what he wants. And they ask, have you come in peace? And he says, I am here to perform a sacrifice and worship the Lord with you. Yes, I come in peace. And so they go back into their into the village of Bethlehem. And it's a big impromptu festival is my impression of it from reading the word. And, and one of the 
family heads that is there is Jesse, the grandson of uh, Boaz and Ruth, if you remember. And, and he is there. He's a Bethlehemite. And, and the Lord reveals to Samuel that the house of Jesse is where the next king will come from. So, at this festival, Samuel inspects seven sons of Jesse and the Lord rejects every one of them. And he turns to Jesse and says, so these are all your sons? And this is horrible when you feel like you've heard the Lord wrong or something. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what the next step is. And Jesse says, well, there's one that's so insignificant that I didn't even tell him to come. He's in the, He's in the field with the sheep. But messengers are sent for young David, and young David is brought to the festival, and Samuel receives a word from the Lord. This is him. For all of David's brothers, God had said, uh, look, Samuel, I know you're impressed by what you see in this young man, but God sees what's on the inside. Don't look on the outside. God sees the heart. But when it comes to David, God says, this is a man after my own heart. This is the next king of Israel. And he anoints to show everybody. And so I think it was fairly public that the elders and everybody in Bethlehem knew that the man of God had shown up to Bethlehem and anointed this young man, too young to be in Saul's army. And in our army, that would at least be 18, right? And, and it wouldn't be much different back then. Too young to be in the army, yet, as we will see, and yet Saul, uh, Samuel has anointed him as the next king over Israel. So later on, when it becomes important, there are probably rumors flying around that, hey, you know, Samuel said this was the guy. And Saul goes, no, 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 no. I, I want my son to sit on the throne. Time goes on and an interesting thing happens at the palace. Since Saul, King Saul and... Boy, I'm still getting those guys confused, aren't I? Sorry about that. Read your Bible later and figure out what really happened, all right? Uh, King Saul... <laughs> Saul, Samuel, whatever. You should know this already, by the way. You know. uh, King Saul is in his palace and because he and God are not on good terms anymore, the Lord actually sends a tormenting spirit. A tormenting spirit to torment Saul and give him uh, just anguish of some sort. And some advisor of King Saul says, Let's find a good harp player. And maybe he even had the idea of, let's find someone who will worship the Lord. And we will find this man. And maybe if he plays the harp and worships the Lord, perhaps the Lord will tell this spirit to leave you alone. And they found a shepherd boy. Now, I'll never forget my freshman year of college. I played my guitar a lot. We didn't have the Internet we didn't have social media like we had today. In fact, no one I knew had a cell phone at that time in the year 2000. I just remember playing my guitar a lot. So there's David on the hillside with his sheep all day. There's a few interesting uh, things that happen, but they're few and far between. And so he's out there with his harp all day. So he's really good at it. And lo and behold, when no-name David shows up at the palace because someone found him and said, hey, he's good at the harp, and he plays and sings... Maybe even some of the psalms that he had already written, some of the songs that he sang to himself on that hillside about how I'm watching sheep, but the Lord is my shepherd. The spirit that was troubling Saul would leave him alone. And so, already the spirit of the Lord is against Saul, but with David. So David goes back and forth from the palace to the uh, to his home in Bethlehem, and uh, and and at one point when he is home, he is watching his father's sheep. King Saul has taken the army off to fight the Philistines. Now the Philistines are Gentiles; they are not Hebrews; they are not Jews, and they live, they still live in part of the land that God told them to conquer. That is very important to the story. The Philistines live. The, the children of Israel were supposed to conquer all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. But instead, they, they, for whatever reason, they decide they're not going to conquer those Philistines. And the Philistines, by this point, are the dominant military power in the area. And they're having constant conflict with these coastal cities inhabited by Philistines and the more inland um, 
foot soldiers and sheep herders of the Israelites. And uh, so Saul has taken his army to the valley of Elah and they're going to square off with these Philistines. They're going to fight this big battle. The three eldest sons, not only is David too young for Saul's army, but apparently there's another four sons between him and the ones that are old enough to be in Saul's army. So David, in my mind, is getting pretty young at this point. And his father says, I want you to take supplies to the army, meat, bread, cheese, take it to the quartermaster, make sure your brothers are taken care of out there, and also bring back word to me about how the battle is going. And so David arrives at the Valley of Elah with a convoy of, of donkeys behind him. He leaves them with the quartermaster. He finds his brothers and says, Hey, you guys aren't fighting. What's going on? And down in the valley is a man over nine feet tall shouting up at the Israelites from the valley, send your best man to fight me. And instead of everybody fighting this battle, the winner of our little contest would be the winner of the battle. Send your best man to fight me and if he wins, we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will all be our slaves. And of course, he's also cursing Israel by his pagan gods and saying, you know, so you guys are Saul's soldiers. So, you know, you're obviously big fat chickens and all kinds of stupid stuff like this. And David wants to know why somebody doesn't go shut this guy up. I want you to remember that about 400 years before this, 450 years before this or so, the Israelites had been set free from the land of Egypt and they had made their way through the wilderness, not wandering in the wilderness, but straight to, through the wilderness to the land of the promised land that would become the land of Israel. And the Lord had told them that they needed to go in and take the land. And they said, no, because our spies came back and said that the land is full of giants. And here we are. Over 400 years later, the children of Israel did not destroy all of the pagan peoples that lived in the promised land. And there are still giants in the land. And the people who are scared of the giants are the ones who don't have faith in God. And the one young man, probably very young at this point, is the only one who believes that God can destroy this enemy, no matter how big he is. So let's read in our Bibles from uh, as, as David begins to ask all of these soldiers, why doesn't someone go shut him up? I'll go do it. I'll go hit him. I'll, I'll, I'll take care of him. The Lord is on our side. We shouldn't be afraid of him. His older brothers told him to shut up, which is your job as an older brother. Amen. I'm an older brother. His job is to tell everybody to shut up and tell especially younger brothers. And and but the word reaches King Saul that there is a man in the camp willing to take care of our problem, but he's not even really a man yet. And so we read in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Starting in verse 31. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. And Saul tries to put his own armor on David because David's a boy and doesn't have armor. And it's too much. David is young. Saul is head and shoulders taller than everybody else. David says, I can't move in this. I have not practiced fighting in this armor. I cannot do it. David takes the weapons that he is familiar with. He has a shepherd's staff, very useful for a number of things when dealing with sheep. 
and he has a slingshot. Now, before we underestimate the slingshot, armies back then not only had archers who tried to take out the enemy from a distance before you actually had to do sword fighting, but they would have a row of slingers as well. So this is a formidable weapon, and it is something that David has sharpened his skills with in the sheep field, as you've seen, but that's not actually how David described the battles with the bears and the lions, was it? I hope you were paying attention in there because I had every, every cartoon I had as a kid that portrayed this, and every time Dad told the story, it was, you know, man, he probably, you know, he probably hit the lion and the bear with the slingshot. Maybe. I mean, obviously, he's good at the slingshot. But the Bible says when David told the story... If they didn't drop that lamb they were trying to run off with, I grabbed, I grabbed the lion by the mane. I grabbed the bear by the fur of his face and I struck him. Now do you see that this is a man after God's own heart that when the devil who roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, when the devil has you in his jaws, this is what Jesus wants to do for you. He wants to grab that nasty old lion by the mane and punch him in the face until he lets go of you. All right, so this is thoroughly encouraging that God says that's the kind of king I am to my people and so I am going to make David the next king after Saul. What a man. What a thing to aspire to, right, men? To be the man that says, I'm not going to have a fear of lions. I'm going to, I mean, you can be afraid, that's fine, but you just can't act on that fear. You've got to grab him by the mane and just... It, it, now that you're in close proximity to the lion, who should be afraid? Well, the lion should be afraid. That's the answer. The lion should be afraid because he can't get away. That's right. I'm the only one excited about this. Okay. And of course, what's the real moral of this whole story? If the other guy's bigger than you, hit him with a rock. All right. So David goes down there. He picks up Five smooth stones. They need to be aerodynamic. So he goes to the brook and he gets the smooth stones. Some people say that the Bible does record Goliath had five brothers. So that's, or had four brothers. There was five of them all together. So that's why he was picking out that many rocks. I just figured he wasn't going to bank on one shot. I mean, for Pete's sakes, who's that good? And, and, uh, and he gets down there. And of course, Goliath sees a kid with a stick and stones. And, and just... Are you serious? Is he a messenger? Is there a white flag on the staff? I mean, you know, what's the deal? And have you, am I a dog that you sent a kid with a stick to beat me? And Goliath launches into uh, uh, ancient times trash talk. I'm going to feed you to the vultures, boy. And David says, no, I'm going to feed you to the vultures. The vultures are going to feast on Philistine bodies today. Now, kids, you're not allowed to be this rude, okay? Unless you're in the army, all right? And, and I, I, I just love it. You know, you never get to just say, we're going to turn you into vulture food, sucker. I mean, just as a pastor, I definitely don't get to say stuff like that, right? But there is the required trash talking. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, David says to Goliath. I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. So there you go right there. Part of the message is David doesn't have a sword or a spear in his hand because that's not what saves us. Oh, so our unconventional weapons like the slingshot? No, no, no. That's not what saves us either. The point is God saves us. God fights our battles. And so, they get done with their trash talk. I don't know if they're yelling at each other from a distance and then they start running towards each other. Or maybe only Goliath is running and David's got his slingshot out and nails him right between the eyes with the rock. Down goes Goliath. And David runs up to the body. And though the Lord does not necessarily need a sword or spear to save with it, swords are very handy. He grabs Goliath's sword. There's no telling if the rock actually finished him off. So David finishes him off. And uh, 
And if you think the Bible is full of G-rated stories about perfect people without messy lives, I just want you to picture David holding up the severed head of a giant <laughs> and waving it around so that the Philistines and the Israelites can see that God has won the battle for them. And you can only imagine that the Philistines came out of their shock first because they suddenly realized they needed to run for their lives. I thought, I thought the guy that won the champion contest automatically, you know, I thought there wasn't going to be any fighting. Why don't the Philistines just, you know, lay down their weapons and surrender? Well, because, you know, they're liars. Um, but the Israelites probably come out of their shock second when they see the Philistines running and go, ah, we just won. We got to chase them down now. Of course, all the Philistines have just seen a teenage boy beat a giant and they're probably worried that the army of Israel is full of people like that. Well, that, that was one of their kids. What are their grown men like? Holy cow. And the Lord provides a great victory that day. And as we go on and tell more stories about David throughout the following weeks and we find out he's a great king and he ushers in the golden age of the nation, the united nation of Israel. Well, of course he did. <laughs> he could already kill a giant when he was a boy. My goodness. Of course we expect great things from this guy. But of course, anytime we talk about King David, we are not just talking about the man King David who's not perfect and he messes up and for the end of his reign, he's a bad king too. Not quite like Saul. David repents of the bad things that he has done. But God makes a promise to David. You will always have a descendant on the throne and someday you're going to have a descendant who sits on the throne forever. Forever. And so as you read the boring parts of the Bible like the genealogies and the names and who begat who and everything, you find that King David produces a line of kings. And that line of kings ends when God allows the Babylonians to flatten Jerusalem and carry all the people off. But it wasn't exterminated. And it pops up again 400 years later when they do a census and everybody who is descended from David is supposed to go to Bethlehem to register for the census and the village of Bethlehem is chock full of people because David had 300 wives. And there's a couple there named Mary and Joseph, who no one would notice at the time, but today we've been talking about them for 2,000 years. Descendants of David who, produced, who have a child. Mary produces him, Joseph doesn't. God does. And he is the descendant of David who will sit on the throne forever, not just ruling over Israel, not just ruling over part of the Middle East, but ruling over the cosmos, forever. Not only can we look back on King David and say, man, what a cool guy, but we can serve under the greatest king, the only king that there ever should have been to begin with, Jesus Christ. And not only does He reign above us, but He subjected Himself to be below us, to be our servant in humility, and die the death that He didn't deserve, but we did, so that we could live the life that He purchased for us. Not just in this world, but throughout eternity in the next world. We're going to have a quick song of uh, invitation as our instrumentalists come forward. And then we will get to the business of the Lord's Supper. So this morning, <clears throat> if you would like to follow the real King David, not the one from the Old Testament, but his descendant that is going to sit on the throne forever and be a better King David than even King David was. We invite you to come forward and we want to introduce you to King Jesus, the ruler of the universe who wants to be the ruler of your soul. Would you stand with us, please?